All right, we'll slowly get started, everyone. My name is Eric Racine. Thanks for joining us today. I'm a professor of health ethics at the Montreal Clinical Research Institute and the University of Montreal. And I have the pleasure of uh, chairing this first uh, panel of a new network, the Living Ethics International Network. And as you may have seen from the announcements, uh, this is work that is being or the series being put together by three of us in the network, Karen from Mexico, Jayashri from India, as well as myself. And uh, the three of us will be hosting um, a series of discussions on living ethics, which uh, probably made you a bit curious and eager to learn more. And that's why you're here with us today. And uh, we are very uh, grateful for a number of sponsors who uh, are helping us getting the word out about this new network and its activities, notably this uh, mini series of online panels. So today's uh, event will be focusing on the idea of a living ethics. We're hoping to learn more about this idea and share, and we have an amazing panel uh, which I'm going to be introducing in a few minutes. But before doing so, what I would like to do is uh, give a bit of background on this idea of a living ethics and where this is kind of uh, springing from. Um, so I'll spend a few minutes doing this before I introduce the panel. And then we'll hear uh, through various rounds of discussions uh, more about uh, living ethics and we'll allow you the public, the audience, to ask questions and make comments after each round of exchanges between the panels. So just uh, to make headway in giving more background about living ethics, I simply want to point out that much of what I will be uh, presenting today comes from an inaugural discussion paper on living ethics, which uh, basically came out uh, early this year in the journal Medicine, Healthcare, and Philosophy. And this is uh, a paper reporting the work of a large group of Canadian bioethicists, healthcare professionals, and patients and other stakeholders who came together to um, kind of um, further develop this idea of a living ethics. So you probably are asking yourselves, if you're less familiar with this idea, well, what is a living ethics? And in this paper, we um, point out that living ethics is not really a concept, for example, like you uh, could envision autonomy being an important ethical concept or a concept that has a lot of weight in, in ethics. It is also not a principle, like the principle of respect for autonomy would be. It is also not a theory, like, uh, for example, we could have uh, theories of autonomy that explain what autonomy is, why it's valuable, how it develops in human beings and what challenges autonomy and so forth. So it is not those things, it is uh, defined as a stance. And a stance uh, is further explained as being a position or a posture that is taken, or may, maybe an alternative explanation is a vantage point from which knowledge is generated, used, and, and from which practices make uh, sense or not. You could also see it as a basic set of our orientations and assumptions about how ethical tools like concepts, principles, and theory can be used and practiced. So it is something more upstream that guides the use of um, other components of ethics theory. Um, and in this paper, um, there are two important aspects and meanings of living ethics which are presented. The first being that a living ethics is connected to life and existence or human existence in ways that reflect the fact that human beings are always in interaction with their social and ecological environments. That's what the idea of transaction means. And also uh, ethics is defined as being uh, in movement and adapting, promoting learning and growth in face of novelty and diversity of values. 
in concrete situations. So those are two major aspects which I'm only presenting and alluding to very briefly today to give you an idea of what has been done so far to define this idea, this stance. You're probably wondering, well, why this, this group came up with this idea of a living ethics sense? You know, what's the purpose? And the way the group made sense of this purpose is to explain that we need a more profound, complete, and accessible lever of human flourishing uh, in ethics. Or ethics should be envisioned or could be envisioned, or that's the way we want to envision ethics as a more impactful and powerful tool for human flourishing. And that means, for example, further connecting ethics scholarship to substantive experiences and existential problems, problems and the kinds of situations that give meaning to ethics, the real pain points, so to speak, in everyday life, beyond uh, mere compliance or norm following. So the two different uh, angles um, that we can think of here. Second, uh, uh, there's a desire uh, in the group to create times and spaces where ethical discussions about problems can truly and genuinely happen. So this paper recognizes that for ethics to live, there needs to be sp space and time uh, to do so. Third, uh, the group uh, uh, put the idea forward that we need to facilitate more accessible forms of ethics processes in ways that allow fellow citizens to engage with ethical questions and participate actively in deliberation, to really open up the game in ethics to a broader array of stakeholders. And in more recent work, which I'll be talking about, that stems from an international co-development group, uh, a fort rationale was put forward, which is to recognize the interconnectedness of human beings and their social and ecological environments. Now, uh, you're probably wondering, well, how do we put this in practice? And so the, the international working group I was alluding to has just submitted a position paper, which uh, uh, points to six important methodological orientations, basically uh, orientations that a living ethics project or initiative uh, would be uh, following. Uh, so the six ideas are that a living ethics exercise needs to be experientially grounded in human experiences and, and difficult situations. It needs to be fostering flourishing and well-being of human beings. It needs to deploy itself as a learning exercises where people learn from each other. Uh, also, a fourth idea is that uh, this learning needs or can be done or is uh, is favorably done through dialogue. And dialogue means recognizing also different forms of knowledge in, and therefore uh, to be fair to what people know. That's the idea of epistemic justice. A living ethics exercise uh, should empower and lead to action. And then if we're thinking about directions for actions, this exercise would not reflect the imagination of only uh, a single person or people in authority, but all stakeholders involved in situations. That's the idea of co-imagining futures. So as I mentioned already, uh, this idea has been developed by a Canadian working group so far, and this effort was accompanied by an international advisory committee leading to the paper I mentioned earlier. And then a second round of work was uh, initiated by an international working group, a uh, very kind of a diverse group from many, many areas of the world. And uh, this group has worked on and submitted a new paper further describing the methodological implications of a living ethics stance. Following a meeting in Montreal, late 2023, to which uh, some people here around the table, or I think all people around the table participated. Now, uh, uh, following this workshop, a Living Ethics International Network has been put together 
and this is part of uh, this this today's activity is part of the activities of this network there are many projects um that are being uh carried out uh, following a kind of living ethics inspiration we'll be hearing more through the series about these projects but i want to point out a bit what's on the left which is uh, the fact that uh, this network is publishing a newsletter, which you could be interested in. And also a group of people in uh, the network are putting together an edited volume, which is scheduled to be published by Routledge, uh, probably early 2026 and to be completed uh, in 2025. And so this is uh, sparking movement but at the same time i think everyone involved in these activities so far recognizes that there are many pieces of the puzzle missing so living ethics seems to be an interesting and inspiring idea um, and i'm hoping we'll make headway and kind of further defining this idea and fleshing it out fleshing it out sorry today but there are many uh many pieces missing many much work to be done to further define this idea, think about its uh, practical, methodological implications, and, and so on. So this is exactly why uh, a, a panel uh, broaching this very question is being uh, put together today. And my task today, uh, that's the nicest part of my task, actually, <laughs> is to introduce uh, wonderful colleagues who are, uh, in many ways, pioneers and precursors of living ethics, even though they probably were not talking about their work in this um, in this way, uh, but I'm going to make connections to recognize that uh, this work is uh, very deeply rooted in ongoing and prior work. So to start us off, uh, I want to introduce Susan Metzler. Susan is an ethicist and senior researcher at Amsterdam University Medical Centers. Uh, we could say of her that she's a kind of a philosophical engineer or architect because her work um, is uh, all about developing clinical ethics instruments and tools that uh, help professionals navigate moral challenges and improve the quality of patient care at the same time as developing the moral abilities and resilience of healthcare professionals. So thank you, Susan, for joining us. Uh, and I, I know you're just coming back from travel, so we really, truly appreciate you being able to be with us today. Next is Matthew Hunt, who's a professor at McGill University School of Physical and Occupational Therapy. Matthew is a pioneer of ethics in rehabilitation, and at the same time, uh, cultivates a, a really interesting uh, additional expertise in humanitarian health ethics. Um, so there will be much to say about Matthew, but I want to point out that he has published a very influential paper on moral experience and bioethics and um, that sets the tone for some of the ideas of living ethics. And uh, notably, he's also pursuing uh, projects, including a project called Levier in French, or Le Le Lever which is a recently launched living lab situated in a rehabilitation hospital that adopts a living ethics approach. Third, we have Jayashri Dasgupta, who's an adjunct professor in healthcare management at Chitkara University in Punjab, India. She's also co-founder of Sanvidna Care in India, and her research focuses on mental health and dementia care services in resource limited settings uh, in ways that incorporate um, and emphasize low and middle income context perspectives and global research. So thanks Jayashri again, given the huge time zone difference for being with us today. And last but not least, we have Daniel Bookman, who's a bioethicist and scientist in Education Research at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, or what we know colloquially as CAMH in Canada. Um, Daniel is a social professor at the Tala and Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And he leads a, uh, a lab, which I, I love the name, it's called the Everyday Ethics Lab. 
Again, I think this is a very interesting concept to bring into the conversation today. And uh, in his work, Daniel focuses on many topics, including mental health, substance use, and chronic pain. So thank you, the four of you, for uh, joining this panel. I know you're all very, very busy people. Um, and, and we're very grateful to, to have you on board on this first panel. So the way we're going to work things out today is basically uh, um, invite you to comment on um, uh, a, a question and then we'll give you time to answer and we'll pick up some questions from the Q&A. So for those who have questions, please present them in the Q&A or raise your hand. We'll try to pick some up and then we'll make headway in the conversation and maybe tackle a second and um, and maybe probably not a third question. We won't have time today, but uh, the idea is really to set the conversation. So uh, that's not really uh, an issue for us today. So for, first, a uh, grounding question for, for the panel is, what is this idea of a living ethics? Uh, how would you describe this? And maybe what do you see or project in this idea in terms of what it should be or should become? So um, given her uh, recent travel, I'm going to spare Susan from starting uh, this panel. And then I'm going to invite Matthew to maybe launch us. Uh, and then Jayashree, Daniel, and Susan. So Matthew, what is living ethics? Yeah, fantastic, Eric. Thanks um, for putting this together. It's really exciting to have the opportunity to continue this conversation. I feel like I'm learning about this and uh, trying to sort through ideas related to living ethics as we go along. And I think actually that is part of the answer as a starting place, right? Is living ethics, it's a shared project that's um, an opportunity to learn and grow and, and develop. I'm gonna maybe pick up on um, the piece, Eric, that you introduced, because for me, it was actually the biggest stumbling block is what is living ethics? You started with the idea that it's a stance or an orientation or a posture. And uh, and we had a lot of discussions about this, like what does it mean to call something a stance? You described it as upstream um, and something that comes before a starting place maybe for thinking about and, and using different resources and theoretical approaches and, and things that might line up with some of the commitments associated with, with living ethics. I'm a physiotherapist by, by training, and uh, I often think about bodies and embodied action. And uh, I, when we first talked about this, I really thought about the idea of a posture, both from the, or, you know, just the idea of like, it's this way of beginning or this way we have to orient ourselves. I was literally thinking about the, the bodily posture that might capture the living ethics approach. And so when I was thinking about that posture, um, it's not a posture where we're back on our heels and settled in our ways. It's a posture where we're leaning forward and we're ready to, it's, it's, you talked about action oriented and leading to action. Maybe even we're stepping forward because living ethics is oriented towards this motion. Um, and so that dynamism. And then my second thought about the idea of it being a posture, it's a posture of openness. So maybe we're leaning forward and we have this receptivity. Um, I looked this morning at the position paper because I was struck by how often the prefix co, C-O hyphen, was used. It comes up 50 times in the position paper. And it was on your slide. There was co-learning and co-creating, um, co-understanding, co-imagining. These are all four central ideas in that paper. So what is it? It's actually an orientation that is inviting. It's an invitation and inviting people in. So maybe as my starting place to this uh, discussion is just thinking like, what does it mean to talk about the stance or the posture of living ethics? It's some of these things that might invite all sorts of room for, for development, but we're certainly leaning in and we're opening up as we uh, begin to work towards a living ethics approach. Thanks for getting us started and sharing that. So I move uh, Jayashree and invite you also to tell us more. Thanks a lot, Eric. And it's it's really amazing to be part of this group and and co-develop this together. Co I, I love the you know the fact that we have co-imagine in there because that offers so many possibilities. And I think that really captures what um the living aspect of 
living ethics because what really I think appeals uh, with this stance is the, the fact that it represents really this adaptive, dynamic, and very experience-centered approach to ethical inquiry. Um, and coming coming from a low and middle income context and, and in India where we, uh, you know, ethics, you know, ethics consultations or, uh, you know, this sort of inquiry is, the frameworks exist, but there's such a huge amount of diversity that, um, you you're dealing with uh, you have to be inclusive in your practice. I, I'm a clinician, so so when I look at healthcare related decision making and aspects like that, it's there's always um, your decision making is constantly very dynamic. So I think that this this whole approach towards um, you know ethics being dynamic was something that is very appealing and in and dealing with living problems problems that change not only from individual to individual but context to context and person to person even within the same context is something that was very um you know interesting in in this you know as the stance is getting developed and the other aspect which i think you know in in terms of the of living ethics which is very um interesting is is the is the integration of the different uh, you know the lived experience of the different stakeholders um again Ethics and you know tends to be very academic, or you know it, there are certain groups of people who tend to focus on ethics, and putting the the agency of um, you know ethical inquiry into the people who may who are actually a part of it, and incorporating all of the different stakeholders as part of this process is again something which I think uh, you know living ethics is that's that's what it. Um, you know, is, is being developed as, and it's one of the core aspects. So, I mean, I think those those are the kind of um, ground, you know, th those kind of core aspects, uh, things that are really um, interesting uh, from the context in which I, I work and I come from. Thank so you I just kind of stop there. Thank you for sharing that, Jayashree. Uh, Daniel, you'd be next because we want to spare Susan for last. Uh, thanks so much, Eric, and, and so wonderful uh, to be part of this. Thanks for putting this together, and it's been an absolute you know, honor to, to be part of these discussions and this international group and thinking through these things. And, and I actually say like muddling through many of these ideas and trying to figure out as a group, like what does it mean? How does it relate to our existing sort of ways of knowing? How does it create or generate new ways of knowing? Uh, and how we are in the world with others, which I really think is sort of sort of fundamental to the question of ethics, about how, how should we be with others in relationship to others. And so for me, you know, living ethics as a, as a concept, you know, really resonated for a few different areas. One, um, so I'm coming to this as both a practicing healthcare ethicist or a healthcare ethics consultant, clinical ethicist, and also an academic scholar in, in bioethics. And plus my sort of life and lived experiences uh, that I have in each and every day. And, and so for me, the idea of living ethics and what we've been talking about, you know, really resonates with this, this sort of profound idea of everyday ethics. And as you mentioned, and, and Eric, thanks for the shout out to me for, my, for my lab, but I, I, I was so taken by this concept that you've written about, um, that others have written about, um, and Matt who's written about in his moral experience piece, which I'll get to in a moment, um, just with how this is the ethics of the ordinary. And this is the, the ethics of the mundane. And this is the ethics of the everyday. These are these small moment to moment encounters that at least in the context in which I work as a practicing healthcare ethicist, you know, people experiences, patients and families and healthcare professionals and teams and organizations that, you know, aren't big headlines that you're not gonna see in, in the news or these big bioethics concepts you know, that might, you know, get the attention or, or sort of fill a syllabus of an undergraduate bioethics course. But this is the everyday encounters or set of encounters that are really deep with, with significance and moral meaning. And as a clinical ethicist in my work, I, I see that every day. These, this is what people, people struggle, with, struggle with. You know, how should they relate to this patient? How should, um, you know, we interact with this patient that's going to be meaningful? You know, sometimes 
um, treatment decisions or what we think might be so significant about certain treatment decisions may not really be what it is for the person who's going through them. I, I remember a number of years ago, a colleague was talking about, uh, maybe it was a paper they wrote or something about brain surgery. And they thought that, you know, patients would be so concerned about, you know, infections, risks, and, and you know, um, you know, will I ever sort of be able to, you know, you know, do things they want to do. And of course, people are concerned about that, but, um, or questions about the surgery, the instruments they're using, but like a lot of the time, many people were concerned about when will I be able to wash my hair? And for that person, that meant a lot. So that, so that was sort of an every, like an everyday issue and, and how to talk to that, you know, how to talk to that person about that. And this, you know, gets at this moral experience question. And, and again, looking to Matt's work and others on, you know, the sort of the, spec, the, the spectrums of good, bad, right, wrong, just, and unjust, and how that manifests in, you know, your everyday encounters of, let's say, healthcare experiences specifically. And so also as a scientist um, who's exploring these, these, norm these questions from a normative perspective in bioethics, but also um, as an empirical, from an empirical perspective, I'm interested in how, you know, can we use different empirical approaches in bioethics in order to get at these, these people's experiences or set of experiences on these spectrums of good, bad, right, wrong, and just, and unjust. So that's, that's you know, um, been intriguing to me also about living ethics and, and the different ways and the different ways of knowing what we might integrate into that methodological piece. And finally, and just briefly, I'll say, you know, Matt, you also mentioned the, the co piece, um, you know, showing up a lot. And I was also like intrigued by that, but I would say I'm, I'm intrigued by the co and what that means, but I'm actually intrigued in the hyphen. And so the relationship between the different or multiple parties and what that hyphen represents. And, you know, we, we talk in healthcare a lot about shared decision-making and this also is very much an everyday or living ethics kind of experience or set of experiences. And, and we say, you know, we have the shared decision-making to flatten power hierarchies, to have people be more involved, but we know that power hierarchies exist in healthcare. We know we can't get rid of that. Um, and so when we think of what this hyphen means for you know, for collaboration, or we think about what the hyphen means for co-design or co-production or co-development, you know, what does that look like from a, a living ethics standpoint? What is that, you know, what power dynamics still exist? Which ones can we compress, perhaps not completely eradicate, but maybe compress? What does that interdependent thinking and process look like? So these are some of the questions I'm still muddling through, and I'm really excited to continue on with them. Mm. I was going to say maybe a perk of French language is that we don't have the hyphens between the co <laughs> and, and the words, uh, but that doesn't really solve or magically solve how we in integrate people and, and work with people uh, in, in ethics. So uh, yeah, there's still a hyphen, maybe it's symbolic. Uh, <laughs> and Susan, uh, your thoughts on living ethics and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for this great honor to speak in this uh, very first uh, panel uh, of this uh, series uh, on living ethics. And it has been an absolute joy and pleasure to have to be working with you and the entire international group on uh, the foundations of a living ethics. Uh, many inspiring things have already been said, and I think I'll just say the same thing, but in my own words. But if I have to articulate what for me is the core of living ethics, then I would say, and I think this is also a very epistemological position, that the moral expertise of the ethicist as an academic is not sufficient to answer or deal well with uh, moral problems in practice. And that you need the encounter with complementary expertise of stakeholders, uh, people involved uh, in the situation in which that moral problem occurs. So I think bioethics has always been about um, practical odd questions or odd questions that arise from practice and that bioethicists uh, seek to answer by theorizing and reflecting. And I think that still goes for living ethics. But I think the big difference is, is in that process of theorizing and reflecting, or you do that together um, with those 
who have a stake in the situation, who are involved in the situation. And for that, you need specific methodologies. You need participatory approaches. You need dialogical approaches. And I, I was very flattered that you called me a philosophical architect. But indeed, thinking about those methodologies, how can you streamline or um, methodologically structure this process of joint learning, of co-creation, of co-development in such a way that it's not so much the ethicist facilitating the dialogues among stakeholders and that they decide what is the best thing to do, but it's also not just the ethicist theorizing. So how do you create a situation in which those complementary experiences and expertise really come together and transcend beyond the limitations of, of each perspective? And that sounds very abstract, maybe to give a very a uh, concrete uh, example, in my Cura study, uh, there was a practical, there was an odd problem arising from practice, and that is, the, well, healthcare professionals um, find they have the need to reflect on moral challenges in palliative care practice, but they don't have the means or the tools or the support to do that in the right way. So this was the starting point for uh, a study in which we work together with uh, healthcare professionals from different professional backgrounds, experts, uh, patients, patient representatives, volunteers, in order to construct a method that could truly provide support in daily practice in dealing well with the challenges that caregivers were or are facing. Um, yeah, and, and we really thought about, okay, how can we do this in such a way that uh, we just we just don't go along with everything that people say, but also um, really try to develop this together. Um, and also when you determine whether indeed you have solved this old question or this moral problem, you've answered this question, you've solved this problem. I think the outcomes that you look at are really important. I think a living ethics uh, stands is focused on human flourishing. And that also means that you have to assess, uh, do people indeed flourish eh, under this solution with this answer? And do all people do that? So paying specific attention also to social injustices, to the different groups that are involved in the situation at hand. And maybe you can look at improvements in quality of life or moral resilience or uh, quality of care. So I think that's also really important. What do you want to measure? How do you want to assess that the problem is dealt with uh, sufficiently? Okay, maybe let's leave it here, but yeah. Great. Thank you so much for sharing these ideas uh, and getting us uh, fired up about talking more about, uh, you know, the nature of living ethics and its implications. Did some of the panelists want to react or add to uh, what they heard from their colleagues. I'll give you a, a moment to do this as I'm kind of screening through the Q and A, um, just to see if we pick up a question. So maybe what I'll do is uh, um, look at the Q&A now, and we have Robert Beats, who is the Executive Di Director of the International Neuroethics Society. Many of us know him very well. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for being here. Uh, he's asking, who's most likely to implement living ethics concepts and practices? Perhaps the components of the stance into their work in social justice and system change, as opposed to health and healthcare fields. So I think this is kind of a two-part question, maybe one of them bringing attention to like social justice and system change and who's most likely to implement these ideas or maybe who's most um, uh, likely to be attracted to these ideas or to benefit from these ideas. Do you have any thoughts on this point? Matthew, yeah, I'll let you uh, kind of jump in. Yeah, maybe I could uh, speak to one thing, which is, uh... You know, we, we've talked mostly about uh, or underlying, or I think many of our comments is a, a healthcare context that we've been thinking about and talking about. 
And, um, and that's the orientation, I think, of many of the people who've been involved in articulating living ethics, but there's nothing that would suggest why living ethics is uh, specific to, to health and healthcare. Um, and if it, it is about health, it's about a very wide conception of health, even if uh, you bring that into the healthcare dimension. You mentioned that the, Eric, that the newest articulation also was integrating more ecological um, sort of perspectives uh, of, about health itself, but also the notions of flourishing. So I just like to put on the table too, that living ethics is probably quite transversal. It's something that could animate reflection, discussion, action uh, across fields. I don't know that healthcare it would be more amenable to this, um, except you know often uh, we're talking about situations where or or elements and aspects of human flourishing really come to the fore when we are experiencing uh, health and ill health, um, people being in situations uh, of vulnerability and it might bring us to these sorts of reflections, but. I can imagine people in community development context being really excited by living ethics, things that are maybe more oriented towards uh, close connections with people and their lived experiences in the mundane and everyday uh, context that Daniel was talking about. So what does that look like? So I, I, I think it's a pretty wide tent and maybe, um, maybe there are particular challenges uh, for healthcare because of some of the power differentials that we talked about that it might be easier than uh, in other spheres to, to approach this, but they might have their own challenges too. Um, I think one of the things that going into, like how do you get into a conversation about living ethics? How do you bring this up in, uh, and get people talking and rallying around these ideas? Well, maybe that's one of the places where healthcare has the advantages maybe that I mentioned before, the health context that to bring us to a conversation about um, about human flourishing in situations where people might be experiencing struggle and challenge of particular concrete natures related to uh, to their health, that that might be facilitating for for those sorts of discussions. So it might have its strengths and its limitations, and there might be other places where this is already happening, and and maybe people are calling it something different. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthew. Uh would anyone want to take a stab at answering this question or providing more comments? No, uh, Jayashree? Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add that I think it's uh, it's an interesting, uh, you know, kind of a, a, an approach that could also um, lend to discussion that could actually influence a lot of policy uh, level change, uh, particularly around, about, around how, um, there's prioritization in, in healthcare because a lot of ethical dilemmas are very um, context specific and culturally embedded. And there is a predominance of say like the biomedical model where there is there are certain very traditional forms of ethical inquiry that take um, predominance. And actually this involvement of stakeholders across different levels can open up a dialogue to incorporate more um, local level perspectives that can then, you know, kind of push um, policy change in a direction towards what um, people may benefit from. And of course, healthcare is an example where that's possible to do, particularly, say, like in the Indian context, where you have multiple uh, local, say, uh, you know, it's not just a biomedical model, there are several local uh, systems of health, and, uh, you know, prevalent, but um, perhaps this could extend to other fields as well. Thank you for, for adding that. So I'm going to maybe pick up another question uh, from Olivia Stein, who's um, kind of formulating the question this way. Expanding on the points of Dr. Metzler, could you elaborate on what you think the limitation is of coming from an academic perspective when applying ethics? And also how to overcome that in addition to stakeholder collaboration? Any ideas? Fantastic. Yes, Susan. Thank yes, you. I'm uh, very triggered by that very good question. Mm -hmm. um, so these, in my experience, it's often about really mundane things. It's about you as an uh, academic ethicist not realizing how practice really works. 
and what kind of, for instance, what kind of ethical reflection is feasible uh, in practice. Um, uh, and maybe you do not, for instance, you uh, ethically reflect on shared decision making at a at the ICU or stroke unit, and you just don't know that practice very well. Who is involved? What is the time frame? Uh, um, how does practice really work? So you need to uh, to get to know practice in order to um, theorize about it. But maybe that's not 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 specific. That's not good enough. Maybe another example. Um, two years ago, um, I got a research proposal funded in order to develop a reflection methods for nurse assistants in home care to to apply new quality standards on home care in a good way. And that reflection method. Um, the idea was that it helped people to apply general guidelines to individual and unique situations. Um, so uh, we came to develop such a method and then we tried it out in practice. And so we also observed nurse assistants using this method. And what we found is that most nurse assistants never read those quality standards. Uh, because they are 130 pages and they don't even have a computer in, in, in the place they work because they are just visiting people in their houses using their very Dutch bike. Um, so it's great to develop a method uh, to reflect on quality standards and how you should apply them in practice. But if you don't know that people don't really know these quality standards, or maybe you have to summarize them or um, include them in an other way in a method that you develop. Uh, I mean, you cannot not find that out from the ivory tower of academia. You, you need to engage with practice. You need to observe people uh, doing ethics in practice uh, in order to find out what works well. And that also goes for, hey, you might have all these I beautiful ideas about moral reasoning in healthcare practice and what criteria should be met, which words should be used, how you accomplish an in-depth ethical reflection in healthcare practice, for instance, on a patient. Yeah, but all those beautiful ideas might not be feasible in practice or people maybe don't know certain words or um, uh, certain criteria may create obstacles for people. So I think it's really important to know what is feasible in practice and um, also what the reality of, of pra practice in all its messiness uh, looks like. And yeah, you, you need to observe uh, practice. Uh, you need to observe people reflecting in practice in order to answer that question. And therefore, you need to go beyond just applying your ethical expertise to practice, if that makes sense. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, any other panelists wants to add to this uh, answer and this discussion? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in just briefly. Yeah. Then we'll um, move on to, to the next question. Yeah, then. Yeah, and so it's building on, on some of Suzanne's points and, and also uh, Jayashree's um, ideas. You know, I think what living ethics can offer here is maybe a way of engagement or a way of um, of, of this co-development, co-production, co-collaboration um, in order to perhaps make visible in a way that wasn't before the everyday ethics language of non-content expert communities like you want to call it that and by content expert i mean content expert in ethics so so i mean i think is you know ethics is really foundational to, to human behavior to how people organize themselves how they relate to one another and i think people uh in various publics are, you know, non, again, ethics content expert publics are using language of ethics all the time, but not perhaps not using it in with the specific, you know, language that we might learn as we sort of develop our content expertise in this area. So I think it's, 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 it'll may, it maybe it might allow that to be made more visible to different people involved in those discussions and saying, hey, actually, like, you know, these populations, not necessarily in the health domain, could be in multiple different types of domains, are actually very concerned with right and wrong, good and bad, and just and unjust. And 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 this is how people are are speaking about, you know, how we ought to be with one another and in ways that, you know, so perhaps even able to develop a shared language. 
Thank you. So what I will uh, now invite us to do is to consider maybe um, a next question for the panel, which um, would be the following, is how can ethics live in practice or in practices? And this is maybe um, kind of a, a way of formulating the question that gets to this idea, you know, the, these kinds of ideas that uh, living ethics sprouts, of thinking about how ethics can live in practice. Maybe you have ideas on what are the conditions that allow really ethics to, to be contributive uh, to, to practices and everyday context. Maybe you have ideas on the outcomes or the signs of life, you know, of ethics. Um, what would be signs that, you know, something is going on that ethics is really contributing and living in a, in a given environment. Maybe you want to respond by the default, you know, of when, when you're seeing that it's not, um, but, um, I'm throwing the question out there and then maybe I'll invite Matthew, Dan, Jayashri, Dan, and Susan to uh, give us ideas about this. Matthew. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, my comment will, comments will build directly on what we were just talking about a moment ago. I, I think it was there and we weren't saying it um, yet about the importance of epistemic humility around expertise. It's something that's really been emphasized in our conversation so far. So. Not just what are the conditions, but what are the, uh, you know, what are the capacities of people who are seeking to embody this stance? One of those key components is also, you know, a recognition about uh, the fallibility of our own positions, the openness to learn from others, um, and the need always to be working together if we're uh, taking this approach that our expertise is, uh, you know, one angle of view, and there will be many that give us a better picture, a fuller picture. The second thing that um, I think we haven't really emphasized, uh, but it's there presently, uh, or, you know, it's been there in our conversation is about making moral space. Um, so it too has been really emphasized. And even this notion of architecture, you're talking about Susan, uh, the philosophical architect, you know, Margaret Urban, Urban Walker talks about being an architect of, of moral spaces. And I think that's really interesting and important, like how how, what are those conditions is actually making room for, making spaces for having these conversations. And just uh, very tangibly, yesterday in our living lab, we had what we call the rendezvous vivant. So a uh, living uh, rendezvous in the lobby of the hospital where we had coffee and banners set up and members of the team were actually teamed up with people from the recreation therapy department who had a little booth beside us and invited people to come by and talk with us about uh, their concerns, thoughts about, you know, what was important to them and the care they were receiving or the care they were providing. So lots of clinicians, lots of patients coming to talk. And what was that? It was creating a space uh, for hearing, for listening, uh, and for uh, engaging. And the, the purpose of the Living Lab is that we're going to co-create some research uh, projects, so micro research projects, really relevant to topics. And so we're also, um, so we're sort of seeing what other preoccupations that people have, how they frame and talk and think about their ethical concerns. And then also seeing who might be interested in working with us to try and develop these projects that are aiming towards innovations uh, related to very contextually and you know, rooted in this uh, ecosystem of this rehab hospital. Um, so that's an example of making a moral space uh, and trying to invite people into these conversations. And and a part of our posture then is also this uh, this posture of epistemic humility that we need to aim towards and seek to embody. Thank you for sharing this, Matthew. Uh, Jayashree. Um, yeah, and again, drawing from what Matthew has just uh, talked about in, in terms of the moral spaces, I, I think one of the questions that I would ask is really how can we embed the sort of ethical reflection within the existing community networks or healthcare structures, particularly in contexts where, um, you know, this ethics discussions and inquiry are otherwise very academic in nature and there is a lack of resources. Um, so, you know, for example, what what would that look like? Would, would, it, would it be, uh, you know, creating some sort of community pr practice groups um, 
what would that constitute and how could you, for example, empower existing resources to actually get involved in more of this uh, ethical inquiry? So, for example, um, you know, could frontline healthcare workers become the people who are involved in um, these sort of discussions? Um, and could they facilitate processes, you know, because they're the ones who are actually interacting more with, um, you, you know, people, uh, you know, patients on the ground? So could they be, you know, how could, how could you have them to understand what are the various ethical principles that they need, you know, that they could think about? How could that become part of their training and how could they incorporate these diverse perspectives? So I think that the whole living ethics um, stance um, and, and, you know, offering training on that and developing um, that as a part of the way in which existing resources are looking at um, healthcare could be one of the ways in which it lives to kind of um, address solutions or um, you know, adopt different perspectives. And again, in terms of healthcare, one, one of the other things is that, you know, we, the, there is a, you know, living ethics, the co cornerstone is really, you know, the plurality that's involved in there. There isn't just one perspective and it's important to kind of have that sort of acceptance. So how would that look is um, something that I think is, uh, like, again, probably uh, something worth thinking about because it's, I don't, I don't think that you go kind of just like one kind of training will focus on one framework. And um, I think there has to be a way in which you can allow for these different perspectives to get practiced and accepted. So I, I think that's just one of the ways that I would see this as actually living and addressing real life problems. For sharing that, dear uh, Daniel, your ideas. So I'm going to try to attempt in a very half baked way to connect a couple concepts that I think we've been talking about. Um, they're the built like building concepts. So both our architecture and spaces. And um, so something I've been intrigued with lately is this notion of moral architecture or moral des ethical design. And what does that mean? And 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 so I'm thinking, you know, Matt, you're talking about moral spaces and, and how you sort of very intentionally sort of created um, the space in the in the rehab hospital for people to address their ethical concerns. I think there's different, many, it's a great example. I think there's many different ways that people can create a space that is moral, um, right? You know, what do we, what we mean by that? If that's somewhere where people can talk about their sort of concerns that fall on, you know, again, spectrums of good, bad, right and wrong, just and unjust. Um, or you know what sort of what questions can the right thing to do, and then this you know brought like Susanna as the philosophical architect and and thinking about okay so how do these spaces that we create either figuratively or literally with bricks and mortar that reflect our values um, or reflect our ideas about um, let's say good care in the healthcare context right um, and and. So I've been thinking about this also in the context of, of some papers that have come out not too, uh, recently on um, so the ethics of design of psychiatric institutions. My my primary institution is has been undergoing a major um, uh, redevelopment process in the last number of years. So it's a large academic psychiatric hospital, and you know just the sort of the idea like historically of of asylums or historically the idea of what psychiatric hospitals look like were very unwelcoming spaces you know um so brutalist architecture dark colors gray concrete right not things that are maybe conducive or what we might sort of see as reflective of recovery or um or or certain kinds of compassion and, and treatment of and those kinds of values and so how how does a how does something like that be transformed into a, a, a literal space that is that is compassionate, that reflects the values of the population, that reflects, you know, um, what we think good care is? And so, you know, maybe um, so these are some things that are percolating with, with me. And I think, you know, you know, as we think about what living ethics is and how it might traverse sort of a whole range of, of context, right? And we think about like I'm also where it lives. I mean, it lives in all of us. It lives in our spaces. It lives in the ones we create. It lives in the in the natural spaces that we engage with. It lives, and so how are we? How are we? How how is how is this relate to design? And how and reflecting on 
you know, the kind of, you know, not only kind of like spaces we want to, to live in, but the kind of, um, you know, like, like sort of that, again, back to sort of the, the sort of the virtue question of like, who, who, who do we want to be and, and who should we be and how does that reflect it in, in, in our activities? Thank you. Uh, Susan. Thank you. Uh, mm. Well, uh, I really agree that the spaces that we design should reflect uh, certain values and ideas, for instance, about good care or about social justice. Uh, I fully agree with that, that the buildings that we build should um, uh, should reflect that. On the other hand, and uh, now I take an evolutionary metaphor, I think those spaces also, hey, in order to live, they should be able to survive. And that means, hey, as we all know, adapting to the environment. And I think this is new and even a bit awkward for many bioethicists, that suddenly they deal with the fertility of their ideas. And we also have to think about... Um, so the, the spaces that we build, hey, whether those are the spaces in the hospitals that Matthew talks about or uh, training that Jai Shri talks about or the, 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 the values that, um, that you, Daniel, seek to uphold in a psychiatry practice. Uh, so are they indeed feasible? Are they accepted? How do you implement them? So I think we also have to get used to doing feasibility, acceptability, and implementation studies in order to study uh, what can be obstacles in creating those spaces and what can be facilitators. Uh, and uh, do people actually visit those spaces? Why not? Or why do they? Are there certain thresholds that we are not aware of? Do they discriminate? Uh, between people. I think those are really important questions that we are not necessarily used to as ethicists that we will need to ask in order for ethics to thrive in practice and grow. Wow, amazing. I'm tempted to, to conclude there, but I have a few final remarks uh, because time is coming up and the hour is almost up for this uh, wonderful, wonderful conversation. I think Everyone will agree that we really uh, um, had a, a brilliant and articulate uh, set of panelists who have a lot to say. They will have a lot more to bring than, than the current conversation. So I encourage you to, to talk to them, to write to them, to read up their work. Uh, four colleagues I admire very deeply. Um, we had many uh, other questions we could not get to. We had our colleague uh, Abdu Sankor asking a question about how our artificial intelligence could potentially participate in living ethics uh, co-creation, for example. Could it be a stakeholder? Um, Robert Beats had also a very interesting question about how the fact that this is uh, presented as a stance, this idea presented as a stance, encourage reimagining what flourishing and outcome uh, means. And I, I do think there's something in that question that thinking about what underlies things is also a way of, of, uh, uh, of uh, thinking about what um, keeps people together and developing things that hold people together in, in keeping with this idea of thinking about interconnection and how ethics contributes and lives up to the idea of uh, connections between human beings and their social and ecological environments. But that being said, I have to uh, kind of officially, um, basically uh, close the session. Uh, there would have been many, many other questions to address. So thank you to the panelists. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, our next meeting is February 27th. I think it, this will also be a very exciting panel um, so bring uh, your friends, tell uh, about this event, please let the information circulate, uh, share it, and this uh, panel will be moderated by our colleague Karen herrera Ferra. If you have further questions about these activities in the network, you can write to livingethics at ircm.qc.ca for more information. Again, uh, thank you uh, everyone, thank you for your questions, and we're hoping to see you again in February and later next year for another event. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Great conversation. Nice to see you Thank again. You so much. Thank you.